Okay, so welcome everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I appreciate y'all being here for the cat chat today. I wanna to let you know that we have everybody in this room and then we also have a couple of people who are using Zoom to attend the presentation as well. So they can see over the internet uh, my screen and they can sort of see like the top of my head. So if those folks who are on Zoom have questions while we're going, please go ahead and send those questions to me through chat function in Zoom and then I will get to those um, probably at the end or if I see them throughout, I'll touch base with you about those throughout. For those of you in the room, if you have questions, please just raise your hand or holler things out as we're going. Um, we can try to make this interactive if possible and uh, I don't want y'all to get stuck on something and get lost as we're going through. I'd rather just try to address that immediately. So my name is Cliff Rohn and I'm here today to talk with you all about study strategies and about time management. So I have a fair bit of content and I'm going to try to get through it all in about 40 minutes or 45 minutes. The reason being, I know you all are college students, you have plenty of things to be working on and to do, so I don't want to keep you here any longer than we need to, but I also want to share with you the content that we have today. So. Um, really briefly, I just want to tell you, I work at Counseling Services, which is an office here on the Manhattan campus, and we provide mental health services to the student body. So at the end of my presentation, I will talk a little bit more about that just briefly in terms of what services we offer. But of course, today, the purpose of me being here is to talk with you all about study strategies and time management. So we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so that is one definition I found of the word study online. Um, that's not necessarily the definition of study that I would advocate for if you want to be successful academically, but apparently that's how some people consider uh, themselves to study. So what I'm going to talk with you about today are study strategies, including where, what, how, and then I'm going to talk with you about some test taking tips. And for some of you, pieces of this may feel like it's really applicable and other pieces may not feel as applicable, and that's okay. Um, hopefully this information will be fairly broad in general and at least some of it will apply to you. After we get through the study strategies part, I'm gonna talk about time management, specifically the advantages of using time management and then how to use time management. So the first piece of the study strategies I'm gonna talk about is where. So I don't know how well that picture shows up for everybody, but you can see that that student is doing sort of what that definition of study talked about, where she's on the phone, she's got her laptop out, she has her textbook out, she's eating, and she presumably has a TV or something on in front of her as well. So in terms of where should you study, she is studying in a living room or family room, something like that. And I'm not here to tell you what's right for you or what's wrong for you. I just want you to think about what's gonna work best for you. And each person is different. And each of y'all probably has a different living scenario. You might be in a dorm room where you share it with a roommate and you don't really have a choice if they're in the room with you or they have the TV on or that sort of thing. For others, you may live in an apartment by yourself and you may have total control over your situation. But what I want you to think about is what works best for you. Should you study in a public place like a library? Should you study somewhere like a common area in a dorm building or maybe a building on your campus somewhere? Or should you study in the most quiet place you can like a bedroom? Is it best for you to study alone or with classmates? If you're somebody who needs to talk things through and hear yourself say things out loud, then it might be best for you to study with other people. A lot of people, if you go in the library on campuses, usually you'll see there's a fair amount of people who have their earbuds in because they listen to music or whatever it is they're listening to while they study. For some people, that's crucial. They have a really hard time focusing or concentrating if they don't have that background noise. For other people, they can't focus if they have that background noise. So that's something for you all to think about as well. And we were just talking about the headphones in or the headphones out, that goes in line with that background noise or not. And then TV or Netflix on versus TV or Netflix off. Well, for some people, they feel like they need the TV or Netflix as the background noise. For other people, that would just distract them and make it really difficult for them to focus. And then, of course, Facebook open or Facebook closed. That could be on your laptop, your phone, whatever. Uh, for most people, I would argue that that's going to be a distraction and it's not going to help you study. But for some people, they may think it would. If you don't mind, would you sign in for us? And then the last one, phone volume on versus phone volume off. So. Um, I would advocate that if you're trying to get things done productively, you should probably turn your phone volume off. That way you limit the distractions. But again, you're going to have to decide what works best for you. And this is kind of how I feel about 
a summary of this slide, is I think you should try to either commit to studying or you should commit to relaxing. So instead of sitting there with the TV on and your computer open and you're on the phone and you've got your textbook open and you sort of feel like you're studying, but you're also trying to do these things that are enjoyable, I would just encourage you to think about, okay, either I'm going to study right now, which means I'm going to do what I need to do to study effectively, or I'm going to allow myself to relax. And I'm just going to close the textbook and put it away and let myself enjoy some time. So let's talk about what, in terms of studying, these are some ideas that are beneficial for certain people, but not every idea is probably going to apply really well to any one of you. So just take these in, and if it sounds like it might be beneficial to you, then that's something you might want to try in the future. One thing I want to encourage you to consider is doing reviews in advance. So I was a college student. I've worked on college campuses for a long time. I know that most students, they study for the test the night before, maybe two nights before the test. If you do reviews throughout the course of leading up to that test, you make your life a lot easier. You decrease the need for cramming the night before. You've already learned a fair amount of that information going into the week of the exam. So it makes your life a lot easier and potentially less stressful. I would also consider um, encouraging you to organize your notes before you get ready for the test. And when you do that, you can review your notes as you're going through and organizing and getting them in the correct order based on the content of the course. And if you are given a review from a professor for a test or writing a paper or anything like that, you want to do that review first. Anybody know why you would want to do that review first? Exactly, yeah. So you will know what the professor is going to ask. Usually that review is going to have the stuff that they are most likely to ask you about. So if you run out of time but you got through the review, then you probably studied the most important stuff as opposed to some of the less important stuff. Excellent. So here is an approach to studying. It's called the Survey 3RQ method or system. And it's relatively simple. It's an acronym that tries to give you an idea of how to approach studying in general. So the first idea is to survey the material. So let's talk about if you have a textbook chapter that you need to read. The idea of surveying it would mean you open the textbook, you read the heading of the chapter, and then you're going to go through and you're going to read the other headings within the chapter. And that gives you kind of a broad overview of the material. Next, you can go through and read the actual material. And as you're reading it, you want to see if you can recite that material. So maybe one paragraph at a time or one page at a time. Once you finish reading that, you want to see if you can recall that information. And maybe you're going to say this out loud or maybe you'll just think in your head about what did I just read. And if you can come up with that information in your head as you're reading it, then you know you're doing a really good job of paying attention to the material as you're going through it. After you finish the chapter, you want to review it. Ask yourself, what was that chapter about? What were the main points? What should I have learned from reading that information? And then questioning it. So if you have a friend in the class, or maybe you can make questions up for yourself. If there's a, a review portion in the end of the chapter, they may have questions in there for you already to assess what kind of information or how much information you learned by going through the chapter. So when you have opportunities for that, you want to use those as well. If you do this when you go through a textbook chapter initially, studying for the test is going to be a lot easier for you because you will have learned the information so much better when you first interacted with it. So we're going to talk about a couple more strategies for what to study. You can practice generating the information you'll have to recall. So you might take a blank piece of paper and if you have to say learn a bunch of elements for the periodic table for a chemistry course, you can take that blank piece of paper and see how many you can write down. Or if you have information that you need to memorize, you might take that information, have it next to you, have a blank sheet of paper, and write down what you need to memorize until you can do it from memory two or three times in a row without any mistakes. Now, the downside to this strategy is it takes a lot of time. Right? That was a big time investment to be able to do that. The benefit of this strategy is for a lot of people, it's the fastest way for them to memorize lists of information. So I don't recommend, I don't recommend this approach if you're, say, studying for an essay exam because it's not the most effective approach. But if you have to learn a list of information, this might be the best way to do that. And then another idea for generating information is to lecture to the wall. So you might, like we were talking about that survey 3RQ method, if you read the information and then you summarize it out loud to the wall, you're challenging yourself to be able to pull that information out of your own head. And if you can pull it out of your own head when you're reading the chapter to begin with, you're going to be much more likely to pull it out of your head when it comes time for the test. So 
Make sure you know the things that your professor seemed to care about the most. This ties to that idea of doing the review if your professor gives you a review. Usually the things they put on the review is what they care about the most. Another way to think about this is if you were going to impersonate your professor, and if you were going to do that you might be doing it in a mean way, but let's just pretend you were going to do it from the standpoint of what kind of things would the professor say. If you do an impersonation of the professor, the topics that you mention are probably things that are really important to that professor and maybe more likely to be on the exam. So this is just another strategy for thinking about what should I study to prepare myself. Let's talk about how to study. There are a lot of different ways and one is to look at your syllabus. And when you're thinking about the course as a whole or you're thinking about the big picture of the information that you wanted to learn, reviewing your syllabus is a really good way to do that because it goes over the major topics of each class period and should help you have a sense of these are the big picture things that my teacher wants me to learn this semester. And then you can ask yourself to what extent did I learn those things. Other things that are useful to study are if you get a study guide, of course going over that. You should have notes from lectures that you took. You should also have notes if you've been reading chapters or textbooks, that kind of thing. Reviewing those. And then um, identify information for the exam from the textbook itself. So the main points that you think your textbook is trying to get across as you go through the chapters. Other ways to study, utilize your office hours, especially if there's a class where you're struggling or especially if there's a class where you have a hard time, you know, understanding how the teacher is wanting you to learn or understanding the information the teacher wants you to get. Use those office hours to ask your questions to the professor and if you do that throughout the course of a month or a few weeks, when it comes time for the test, it's going to be a lot less stressful for you because you've already addressed those questions throughout. You could also use podcasts or online videos or if there's a concept in a course you're not understanding, you can go to YouTube and just type in whatever that concept is and I practically guarantee you there's going to be a lot of videos on there that you could watch. So especially if you're somebody who learns better by hearing other people talk about things, a strategy like that could be really beneficial for you as opposed to reading the textbook and not understanding it. Rereading it over and over is not necessarily going to help you get it. Other ways that are really useful to study would be study groups, especially if the material is difficult or if you're one of those people who likes to talk ideas out with other people and that helps you remember it. And then lastly, just a little note about studying. If you study too much without sleep, it can actually hurt your ability to remember things. So I know a lot of people cram, I know a lot of people pull all-nighters, right? Those are very common on college campuses and I'm, I'm not necessarily saying you shouldn't pull an all-nighter, but just think about the fact if you were to stay up till say 2 a.m. and go to sleep and get six hours of sleep and then take the test versus if you stayed up all night, you have to consider if I don't sleep at all, how much is that going to hinder my ability to do well on this exam versus if I was able to get six hours of sleep. And for some people, they would be better off to go to sleep, get a few hours of sleep, and then take the test versus staying up and trying to cram the entire night. Okay, some other ideas about how to study. One is to engage your senses. The idea with this is that the more different ways you can interact with information, the better able you're going to be to remember it. So whatever that might look like for you, you can study actively. And one way to study actively is to work with classmates, to talk about the information verbally, to quiz each other on the information. Also, if you know the test format, you can study accordingly. For instance, if you're taking a multiple choice test versus an essay test, you're going to want to study that information differently. A multiple choice test, you're probably going to want to hone in more on the specifics and some of the details and make sure that you know those in a vacuum, if you will. Whereas with an essay test, you're going to want to focus on the big picture ideas and work your way down from there to know how the rest of the information fits within these big picture ideas. So that when you get those essay questions, you can answer as a coherent essay versus with a multiple choice test, you just need to know the specific information in of itself. And then another idea is to use diagrams to organize the material. So diagram is kind of a broad word and that's intentional. You know, use whatever's going to work well for you. If that's drawing um, like a picture of the information, if it's drawing a box, if it's drawing a web of the information and drawing lines to connect each different piece so that your brain can see in a visual sense how the information relates to um, itself. Whatever is really helpful for you and especially if you're an artistic or a visual learner, using diagrams and things could really help you speed up or more efficiently learn the information. So. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but the purpose of this slide is to take a, a second to think about your test taking patterns. So these are um, 
incomplete sentences. And the idea is that you would read each one of these sentences and then you would think for yourself, like if I was asking myself this, how would I finish the sentence? So if you are somebody who struggles with taking tests, and maybe that means you feel really, really anxious, or maybe that means when you take a test, you feel like your brain forgets everything that you studied leading up to the test. Um, asking yourself these incomplete sentences could help you identify why you might struggle with the exams in the way that you do. Now, some of these questions probably won't be really helpful to you, but if you ask all six, my guess is that you would learn a couple things about where you might get tripped up in terms of preparing for exams, or maybe you get anxious the night before exams and you don't sleep well, and that could help you have a sense of, okay, what do I need to do differently in the future to be as successful as possible on my tests? So here are a few test taking tips. Now this bullet says, having a self-talk plan can help you to calm yourself and focus during the exam. Anybody know what I mean by self-talk? Anybody want to take a guess? Talking to yourself? Yeah, out loud or in your head? What do y'all think? Both? Okay. In this instance, I would advocate for you to talk to yourself in your head. So let me give you an example. Like let's say I thought this shirt was really ugly and I walked into a room with a bunch of people. I might think in my head, gosh, I hope they don't think my shirt is really ugly. That's what I mean by self-talk. It's like we hear words in our heads, we talk to ourselves in our heads all the time. So by having a self-talk plan, what I mean is to think through what's difficult for you about a test. Maybe you feel anxious when you first get the test. Or maybe if you're working your way through the test and you come to an answer and you don't know the answer, or you, you come to a question and you don't know the answer, maybe that causes you to feel anxious and worry about your performance. If that's the case, then you wanna have a self-talk plan ready. Meaning you can say to yourself whatever you need to in that moment to calm yourself down so you can refocus your attention on the exam. So the goal here is to keep your thoughts on the test, not on the outcome. Let me give you an example. Um, I work with some students who struggle with anxiety around academics. Um, one of the things that they might do is what we call catastrophizing. And catastrophizing means you take any little thing and you turn it into a catastrophe. So I'll give you an example from a class. Let's say I'm working with a student who gets an exam and reads the first question and they don't know what the answer is to that first question. Their brain might say, oh my gosh, you don't know the answer to that question. You're going to get zero points on that question. You're going to fail this test. Then you're going to fail the class. Then your parents are going to disown you. Then you're going to be homeless because you flunked out of school and you're going to live in a cardboard box down by the river. Right? So some people's brains actually do that. They go from, I don't know the answer to this question to being homeless down by the river. Well, that's problematic because now your brain is thinking about what it's going to be like to live down by the river when you should be focused on this test, right? So what you need to do in those situations is come up with a strategy to be able to stop your brain from going all the way down that path and refocus your attention on the test. So one way to do that, for instance, would be to say, oh my gosh, I'm worrying about this question. It's okay, I'm just gonna skip it. I'm gonna move on to the next question and focus your brain on that next question. Because you'll do a lot better on the exam overall if you can do that as opposed to worrying about being homeless, obviously. So here are some basic ideas for test taking. And some of these things I'm sure y'all have heard before. For instance, start the test as soon as it is given to you. I can't think of a time I was ever in a class, especially a college class, where a test got handed out and somebody just like sat there. Like, I'm not really ready to start it. I think I'll wait a few minutes before I start the exam. So I'm guessing none of y'all do that. But if you do, you might want to consider changing that strategy. Next, a good idea is to scan the test and to notice the point values and to set up a time budget. So for instance, if you're taking a multiple choice question or test and all the questions are worth the same amount of points, then this doesn't really apply as much. But if you're taking a test that has several multiple choice questions, several short answer questions that are worth more points, and then say an essay question at the very end, you wanna take that into consideration in terms of how much time you're gonna spend on each thing. And you might wanna start with the essay question at the end so you can try to get the most points possible as you work your way through the test. So read the directions. Now I know sometimes you think you know what the directions say, and in reality most of the time you probably do know what the directions say. But on the off chance that you don't know what these specific directions on a test say, you might end up doing a whole section of a test incorrectly. Not because you didn't know the information, but because you didn't read the directions and so you ended up doing it wrong. So I want you to get the most points possible that you're capable of, and one of the ways to do that is make sure you take 30 seconds to read the directions. 
Now, of course, you want to answer all questions unless you get penalized for guessing. So again, if you're taking a multiple choice test and you have four options and you guess, you give yourself a 25% chance to get the points. If you don't guess, you give yourself a zero chance, 0% zero chance to get the points. So it's worth it to guess and create an answer even if you don't know. Now with essay tests or questions, you want to make sure to outline your response before you start writing. I know for some people they feel nervous about the time and so they want to start writing as soon as they read the question. But in reality, you're more likely to get the best answer down on the paper if you take a minute or two and you think about, okay, what all am I going to try to say and what order am I going to say these main points in and then actually write out your answer. And the reason that's beneficial is because it gives you a train of thought to use as you go through the question itself. And then lastly, after you're done, if you have time, you want to spend some of that time checking your work. Now I don't mean you know, check it and stress out over every question and change answers and end up losing points because you've, you're so stressed that you rethink things or double think things and get it wrong. But I mean, if you have a few extra minutes to take your time, take some deep breaths and go through the exam just to make sure you didn't make any minor mistakes or things like that. Any questions about test taking before we move on? Okay. So next we're going to talk about time management. So first I'm going to start by discussing the advantages of time management. I'm going to try to sell you all on this idea of time management. One of the benefits is that it helps you know where to begin. So I'm sure some people who are here in this presentation, you've had a situation in your life where you've gotten so stressed out or so overwhelmed about everything you have to do that you don't know where to start. And you end up doing nothing. And maybe you cry or maybe you go watch Netflix or something like that, but you're not actually doing something that helps you cross items off your list of things to do. And if you use time management, it will help prevent those types of situations and it will help you know what you need to do. Another way of talking about the same idea is it, av it avoids wasted worry time. Because if you plan out your time and you know what you're going to do and when you're going to do it, then you don't have to spend time worrying about what should I be working on right now. It also helps you set a pace for both long-term goals and short-term goals. And we'll talk about how it does that. It assures you time for activities not related to studying. So something that's really important about being a college student, and I know that the lives of college students vary a lot. Some of you might be freshmen living in the dorms on campus somewhere. Other, others of you might be non-traditional students that have families, maybe children, maybe partners, maybe uh, older family members that you have to take care of, those sorts of things. But one thing that's really important about time management is it allows you to create time in your schedule for things other than just studying. Because it's important that your life not be just about studying, even though I'm sure at times you feel like it is. It can also enhance a sense of personal control. And most of us like to feel like we're in control, at least of ourselves. And time management can help you do that. It can also increase your confidence and your probability for success. In essence, time management is about creating a plan for how you're going to try to be as successful as possible. And so if you utilize time management strategies, you increase the probability of success. So a major component of time management is adequate planning. And when I work with students, there's a portion of the time where they tell me that, you know, everything is due this week and it's not fair and I hate my professors and they're all evil and I'm sure they all got together at the beginning of the semester and they looked at my schedule and they said, we're going to make everything due for you on this week. And sometimes it's true, right? You have three tests and a paper all due in the same week and that's brutal. But I don't want you to feel like just because you have a bunch of things doing one week that it's impossible or that you can't sleep, you have to pull all-nighters. Because sometimes that may be the case, but ideally if you plan enough in advance, it won't end up being like that. So one of the ways to adequately plan is to write down the dates of exams, papers, presentations, etc. at the beginning of the semester. But in order to do this, you need to have some place that you're going to write it down. And I don't care if this is your phone, if it's a Google Calendar, if it's um, like a paper and pencil daily planner that you keep in your backpack or your purse. It really doesn't matter what it is as long as the system works for you. But you've got to write these things down so that you know you need to be preparing, on, preparing for them ahead of time. So write down reminders of those deadlines that you have. And then here's the key. You have to look at the reminders. So writing them down is obviously not going to help you if you don't reference that, right? So it sounds stupid, but it's true. And if you don't do it, it's not going to be helpful. 
And then when you write down what you have to do, I want you to consider not just the academics in your life, but the other demands that you have as well. So maybe you have a job, maybe you have family demands or extracurriculars like intramural sports or um, organizations and clubs that you're involved in on campus. So I'm gonna go over 10 time management techniques with y'all. And the first one has to do with allotting sufficient time for studying. So one of the things about planning your time is you have to take into account how much time you're gonna need for studying. Does anybody know the golden rule that we tell students here at K-State in orientation about how many hours you're supposed to plan to study? That's right. Yeah, so the golden rule that they tell students here in orientation is three hours outside of class for every hour you're in class. Now my guess is the vast majority of students don't do that. When I was in college, I don't think I did that. But it doesn't mean it's not a great idea. And if you have time, that would be great. But I also want you to be realistic. So if you only have time to study an hour and a half or two hours for every hour you're in class, that's a heck of a lot better than zero. So think about how busy you are and what you've got going on and think about what's realistic for you and then plan for that. So ideally, you will study the same time every day. The reason for this is that our brain and our bodies learn our schedules. And if I had more time, I'd explain this better or in more depth. But the point is that if you wake up at the same time every morning, eventually you won't need an alarm anymore because your body will learn, okay, at this time, this is when I wake up. Well, the same thing happens with studying or with other activities. If you do it at the same time every day, your brain and your body will learn, okay, at this time, this is what we do. So the goal here is the more consistency you can have or the more routine you can have, the better your brain will function at those times when you're wanting to study. So utilize the free hours during the school day. This is probably the most crucial idea that I could share with most of y'all. And the reason for that is in a lot of your schedules, you probably have an hour gap or a two hour gap here and there throughout the week. If you utilize that time to study or work on whatever you need to work on, you will probably free up a lot of time for your evenings and your weekends. And I want you all to have some time to relax or do things for fun in the evening or the weekend. But if you don't utilize that time effectively in between your classes or in between your activities during the day, then what that means is you're putting off all that work and you're going to have to do it in the evenings or weekends. So plan daily and weekly class preparation and review periods. So you remember we're talking about how many hours you need to study outside of class for every hour that you're in class? Well, part of that time studying outside of class should be preparing for your upcoming classes. So say reading a textbook chapter for your course tomorrow or it should be reviewing the information that you've already gone over. So maybe Thursday, Friday in the week, you wanna plan some time to review what you did in your class that week. This helps you solidify that information when it's fresh in your mind, so that then three, four weeks later when you have the test, it's a lot easier for you to learn that information and have that information ready in your brain for the test. You wanna study difficult subjects first. The reason for this is those difficult subjects will typically tire out your brain. And if you save them for last, you might not have enough mental energy anymore to tackle them. Study in reasonable blocks of time with breaks. So let's say that you are someone who doesn't have class or work or anything like that on Fridays. If you create a time management plan for yourself and you say, I'm going to study from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Friday, that's great. That's very idealistic of you, but in reality, you're not gonna study productively for nine hours. It's just not humanly possible. Nobody can do it. So don't expect yourself to do it, because if you expect yourself to do something that's impossible, you're just gonna be upset with yourself for failing. So I would encourage you to, to plan on studying like 45 minutes at a time, and then take a 15 minute break. And maybe that 15 minutes is you surfing Facebook. Maybe it's, um, I don't know, you walking around the library or calling a friend or family member or something like that. Do whatever you need to do to give yourself a mental break, but don't expect yourself to be able to sit down for four or five hours in a row and be productive. And then know your daily alertness pattern. So some people are morning people, right? I'm not, I don't understand morning people. Sometimes I feel jealous of them. But other people are nighttime people where they're most productive from 10 p.m. to like 2 a.m. in the morning. And it doesn't really matter which one you are, but you wanna identify which type of person am I? When is my brain most able to study effectively? And you wanna plan your study times for that time of the day. A lot time for fun, recreation, and non-school activities. Now, depending on how busy you are, you might be lucky to get like a couple hours of TV watching in a week. 
Or you might be somebody who has more time and maybe you have a couple hours of free time every day. Whatever it is, you wanna maximize that time. So if your whole week is booked solid with work and school and obligations, at some point you're gonna burn out. And hopefully you're at least allowing yourself enough time to sleep at night. But I know for college students, a lot of times sleep schedules are pretty messed up. But, and by messed up, I just mean like on the weekends, you'll go to bed late and wake up late, that sort of thing. But you wanna make sure you pencil in time for recreation and fun because that time set aside for those enjoyable activities will help yourself have the energy and be renewed to do what you need to do the next day or the next week. And then plan for and practice good eating habits and sleeping habits. So this is something that you actually wanna put into your schedule. You wanna have time set aside for eating and sleeping because you wanna give yourself the best possible chance to do well. Well, if your body and brain don't have fuel, and if your body and brain don't get rest, they're not gonna be able to function very well. That's just the way the world works. So if you don't sleep a lot, you don't eat healthy, and then you expect your body to perform great, you're gonna be disappointed. So in order for you to perform well, you wanna be fair to yourself, which means giving yourself time to eat, balance nutrition, and sleep as well as possible. And then lastly, leave some unscheduled time for flexibility. And this may just be like 30 minutes a couple times a week, but you wanna be able to to leave yourself some flexibility in your schedule because as we know, life is unpredictable and things will come up. So I'm gonna show you two examples of what schedules might look like. This first example is color-coded and obviously created like on a computer or something. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that you should go create something that looks very similar to this for yourself, but you should consider what am I gonna do in terms of time management? Because if you don't write down anything, if you don't create a plan, if you don't sit down and think about what are all my obligations and when would it be best for me to work on those things, you're probably not gonna be nearly as effective as you could if you did take some time to do that. So here's one of the downsides of time management. You have to spend time figuring out how you're gonna manage your time, right? And whether this is on Sunday evening or Monday morning or Friday afternoon, it doesn't matter. But if you don't set aside some time to figure out what your schedule should look like ideally, then obviously you're not doing time management and it can't benefit you. So in the long run, the idea is that however long it took this person to create this schedule, having this schedule will make up for more than that amount of time to benefit them. And when you make a schedule like this, you wanna consider not just studying, but ideally you would plug in which class you're gonna study for at which time. That way you know you're allotting the sufficient amount of time for each class based on what you can afford to do. And that way you're paying attention to, I need to review for each of my classes each week, or I've got a test coming up, so I need to allot some more time the week or two before for that particular class. Any questions or reactions or thoughts about this schedule? Nope. Okay, let me show you another one. This is a little bit more informal. Obviously somebody just pencil and papered it in, but it really doesn't matter. I don't think this is any less than the other one. The point is just you figuring out how you should be spending your time and making sure you create a plan for that. And these are different too. Like in this first one, you'll notice they have some gaps in there where there's just the blank white space. And that is where they left some time that's not scheduled. It's just flexible time. In this second one, you'll notice there aren't really any gaps except for Friday and Saturday evenings. And ideally, they would have some time in there for um, just some gaps in there so that they would have time to be flexible if things come up. You will notice here in the evenings, they have a fair amount of time set aside for dinner, for TV, and for exercise. And that's great. If you have time to be able to plug those things in, absolutely, you should take advantage of it. You can't expect yourself to work all day every day. Okay. So real briefly, I'm gonna talk with y'all about some barriers to effective time management. So if time management is so great, why don't we all do it all the time? Well, it's because there are some barriers to it. One is that it takes time, and we've already discussed that. Another is technological interference. So by that, I mean the definition of studying, where you have your phone out and you have your laptop up and you've got the TV on. If you have all those things going on, it's gonna be hard for you to use your time effectively. Also visitors, one great thing about college is that hopefully you have some time to socialize, whether that's with friends or family or people in your sorority or fraternity, whatever it might be. But one downside to that is you might have set aside some time on Tuesday night to study and all of a sudden you have a friend walk in or a family member walk in and say, hey, let's go do this or hey, 
take me to Wendy's, I'm hungry, or whatever it might be, right? And you wanna be able to have time to spend with your friends and to enjoy their company, but you also have to consider when do I need to tell people, no, I can't hang out right now, or I would love to do that with you, but instead I've gotta study. So one thing that struggle that some people struggle with is that sense of being assertive and being able to tell people no when you need to tell them no and spending that time studying even though you'd rather be doing other things instead. And then the third one on this slide is prioritizing your time. Sometimes it's really difficult to know what you should prioritize over other things. And one way to think about that is that little diagram up there and the two axes for the diagram, one is importance and one is urgency. And urgency just means how quickly something needs to be addressed. And so the more urgent something is, the more likely you should do it soon. And the more important something is, the more likely you should work on it now. So another major barrier to effective time management is procrastination. And I have a couple quotes up there about procrastination. But I want to talk about one thing in particular, which is motivation. One of the main reasons people procrastinate is because they don't have motivation. And there are a lot of reasons someone might lack motivation. But if you find that you're struggling to feel motivated to study, one thing to consider is tying whatever you have going on right now to your long-term goals. So for instance, let's say you're taking a class and you hate the class and you could care less about the information in it and you wish you weren't in it, but you have to take it because it's a requirement for you to get your degree. Well, I'm gonna guess that there's a reason that you wanna get your degree. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be enrolled in school, right? So if you think about how much you hate that class and you try to feel motivated to study for it, it's not gonna work very well. But if you tell yourself, okay, I'm in school because I wanna get my degree and I have to pass a stupid class to get my degree, you can help motivate yourself, not because you like the class, but because you wanna get your degree and you know that this class is a hurdle that you have to face in order to get your degree. So the whole point with all this is just to acknowledge that when you're struggling with motivation, try to tie the current task to your long-term goals and use that to motivate yourself. Next, I'm gonna talk about ineffective planning, but really I guess I don't need to say anything more about that because we've already discussed that it takes time to do the time management and if you don't spend the time doing time management, then you're going to plan ineffectively and it won't be helpful to you. So a lack of self-discipline. I really don't think most people struggle with self-discipline. I think sometimes people struggle to get things done, but I don't know that a lot of times that's because of self-discipline. I think one of the issues people do run into is they're not realistic. And this is something that we've been talking about a little bit. You need to be realistic with yourself, otherwise you're gonna set yourself up for failure. Okay, so here are a couple of thoughts in conclusion to what we've been discussing. If you do not study effectively, you will not be prepared and you will not perform your best. So I want you all to do as well as you possibly can. And part of being able to perform your best is studying effectively. Also, if you don't plan ahead, your tasks and your responsibilities are gonna pile up and then you won't have sufficient time to take care of them and you're not gonna be able to perform your best. And lastly, if you don't use your time wisely, however much time you have, you will inevitably run out of time and then you'll no longer be able to perform your best. So just sort of summarizing the reason why I'm talking with y'all today about studying and time management. So I have two slides left and this is the next to last slide. Here I'm talking about more assistance. If what we've discussed today was related to what's going on for you but you need more information about these things, well there are resources on campus that can help you with that. One of those resources on the Man and all of these are actually on the Manhattan campus, but I believe they all have websites that have information on them as well. So one is the Academic Assistance Center and they can help with study habits, procrastination, motivation, uh, they can get you set up with tutoring if you need tutoring. If you're concerned about how to talk to a professor, they can help you think that through. So pretty much anything related to the studying and being productive outside of class, that's what Academic Assistance Center is there to help with. We also have a writing center here on Manhattan campus where if you're writing a paper or you're struggling with writing a paper, you can take that paper to them and talk with them about it. And they'll help you think through how to write it. If you've already written it and you want someone to proofread it, they'll proofread your paper for you. They're really helpful and they're really great. And I believe that if you wanna schedule an appointment with them, it's all online nowadays. So I'd encourage you to look up their website if you're interested in them. And then Academic and Career Information Center. They're here on the Manhattan campus and their job is to help students figure out what they wanna major in. So if you're someone who doesn't yet know what you wanna do for a career, or more specifically, you don't know what major you want to focus on while you're at K-State, you can talk with Academic and 
career information center about that. And then lastly is student access center. So if you're somebody who struggles with something that gets in the way of you being as successful academically as you could be, for instance, let's say maybe you struggle with ADHD or maybe as a child you were diagnosed with a learning disorder or something like that. If that's the case for you, there are likely um, some options in order to help you maximize your abilities while you're in college and the Student Access Center would be the place for you to go to talk to about that. So lastly, I want to talk with you a little bit about the resources we have through Counseling Services. We have a website called University Life Cafe and that website provides a lot of different things for students to look at and to read about, to learn about. It has resources related to studying and study habits and academics, but it also has information about mental health concerns, so depression, anxiety, stress, things like that. We also, through our website, have online programs, and I have some flyers about this as well. But we have an online program for academic anxiety, and we have an online program for stress management. So if you feel like you struggle with either of those things, but you don't want to come into our office or say you're not on Manhattan campus and you want to work on those things, you can utilize the online programs for those. We also have something that's called the CLE. It's the College Learning Effectiveness Inventory. So if this presentation today seemed relevant, but you want to learn more about your own habits as a student, and you want to learn what are my strengths as a student, and what are the areas for me to improve or grow as a student, then you should utilize the CLE, which you can access through our website. It's a very brief questionnaire. It takes like five, six minutes to fill out, and then it will give you a, a report printout that talks about here are your strengths as a student, and here are some areas for you to consider working on as a student going forward so that you can be as successful as possible. And then we also at Counseling Services offer things like individual couples, group counseling, career counseling. Um, if you have any questions for us, if there's anything that we might be able to do to help, please let us know. If you're looking for a certain resource, either on campus or online, we might be able to help you find that resource. Or if you have any concerns re regarding mental health or relationships, feel free to let us know. We'd be happy to try to help you with those as well. So that is all the information I had for you today. I really appreciate everybody's time and attention. If you have any questions, please feel free to let me know. Um, if you're online and you want to send your questions, you can chat those to me. I will hang around for a few minutes. So if there's anything you want to come ask about individually, you can do that as well. Um, yeah, otherwise, I hope you all have a great semester. And thanks again for being here today.